Welcome to the second session for the third symposium on advances in approximate Bayesian inference. Today, I am very thrilled to welcome Maya Rudolph, who is currently a research scientist at Bosch Center for AI. She develops deep latent variable models for sequential data and is interested in leveraging neural networks for flexibility in probabilistic models. She worked, she did very influential work during her PhD on extending embedding models to different types of uh, data. And she got her bachelor in mathematics at MIT. Today, she is going to talk about her recent work titled Variational Dynamic Mixture. So Maya, you have the floor. Thanks so much for the warm introduction, Aji. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to tell you about very recent work of ours. Um, this, all the credit goes mostly to my very excellent student, Chen Xu, who is also at Bosch. And this is a collaboration with Stefan Mann from UC Irvine. And um, variational dynamic mixtures is a new variational family for modeling multimodal data, multimodal dynamic data. So many real world data sets, for example, um, taxi trajectories that are here shown on the left, are very highly multimodal. And to be very explicit about what I mean by multimodality, here on the right, um, I have three distributions that are unimodal, right? So um, they're unimodal in a sense that if you would approximate this with a Gaussian, it would cover it kind of well. And on, in contrast, here on the left, we have three multimodal distributions, meaning that the mass, um, there's like multiple areas of high probability mass, but in between there's low mass. So if we um, approximated this with a Gaussian, we would either be, um, you know, maybe covering just one mode and ignoring some aspects of this distribution, or we have these um, over-dispersed approximations where um, it covers the entire distribution, but the Gaussian would also place mass in areas of low density here, for example. Um, and by multimodal dynamic data, we mean um, data like, for example, these taxi trajectories. So here we have two uh, subsets of the data set that have very similar starting um, behavior. But because at certain time points, um, there's like very different behavior in which the trajectories can continue. If we learn a generative model of this data, we want it also to be capturing this kind of multimodality. Um, and we are interested in sequential latent variable models, which means that for each observation X, there is a latent variable ZT associated with it. Um, and um, very simply speaking, what we want to be able to do is given initial observations in blue, we want to be able to infer the latent variables Z. Um, and then we have a generative model that we can simulate forward that tells us how the Zs are related to each other. And then we can draw the axis from them. Um, and the graphical model that you see here, it has a Markovian assumption, but we will actually also be looking at non-Markovian models. So um, the latent variables, they can also depend on all the other past latent variables. Um, and okay, so let's look at how some existing approaching approaches do at modeling this taxi data. So, um, all these methods are presented with the initial blue observations. Um, okay, from a test data, they have already been trained on the large uh, data set of taxi trajectories. And now they are presented with um, 10 initial observations in blue. And this is the forecast they generate. And so here on the right, we have the recurrent common network. Um, which doesn't have stochasticity. So we get one uh, reasonable forecast, but we don't really sample a distribution. Um, then the other methods, um, they do 
reasonably well at capturing something, but they don't really capture all the modes of the distribution, like all these main traffic ar arteries. Like maybe in the autoencoding sequential Monte Carlo, we can see that um, there are some of the different traffic arteries that it's trying, uh, that it's managing to forecast. So there is some diversity in the forecasts, um, but it still places mass um, between the traffic arteries where no trajectories go in the data. And um, then there's also, for example, the conditional flow variational autoencoder. And this is a global latent variable model. So, um, it's actually also giving um, very diverse samples, but um, we can see that it, they're somehow too smooth um, in comparison to the real data. Um, and also the variational RNN, it, the trajectories go into the right direction, let's say, but we can see that there, it's, not, it's not a multimodal uh, distribution that we sample as forecasts. Um, and in comparison, here are the forecasts done by variational dynamic mixtures, um, which I will present to you today, how variational mixtures work. Um, so variational dynamic mixtures are a type of variational method. Um, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this, but um, this is kind of the overview slide of what I will be talking about during this talk. So um, to define a variational method, we first um, define a model of how the um, data and the latent variables are related to each other. And then because inferring the true posterior is intractable, um, we instead define a variational family. So it's a class of variational distributions um, and through optimizing the elbow, um, we find the member of the class that is closest to the true posterior. Um, and so first I will be talking about the model, um, then about the variational family that we use for variational dynamic mixtures. And um, later I will also mention something about the elbow. All right. So here is the generative model. So um, as a sequential latent variable model, we have a transition model for the Z, um, which is parametrized by an RNN that summarizes the history of the past latent state, uh, yeah, of, uh, of the past latent variables. And um, by taking the recurrent state of the RNN and pushing it to a transition network, we get the means and the variances of the transition distribution. And then we also have an emission model that given a sample from ZT, um, we can put ZT together with the um, recurrent state of the, um, of the GRU, we can put it through a decoder to get the mean and the variances of the emission model. Okay, and so this is actually a very standard um, generative model. So, for example, the variational RNN, they used a very similar model. Um, in fact, they also used um, the an autoregressive connection. So, also the observations x t minus one were fed into the GRU. But except for this difference, um, so our generative model is a simpler version of the generative model used for the variational RNN. Um, and so the question is, how is it possible that um, with variational dynamic mixtures, we are able to um, generate such more diverse and multimodal trajectories? And the answer comes from the fact that the structure that um, we learn to generate with the generative model is very closely interrelated with the variational approximation that we use when we learn the model parameters. And so, um, right, we have two tuning knobs that we can use to improve uh, or to yeah, develop a variational method that is more um, suited for 
data with multimodal dynamics. So on the one hand, we can um, increase the variation of family. And um, right, so if we make a larger model, if we choose a larger model class, then um, we might end up with an approximation that's closer to the true posterior. Um, but more than that, we show now that we can um, increase the model class in a way that it includes more explicitly multimodal posterior approximations. And another tuning knob is the objective. So um, the VDM objective, we will regularize it with a term that also encourages um, multimodality. And I will talk about those things next. But first, um, let me introduce our inference model. Um, here are the main ideas. So first of all, in the inference model, we will be reusing the same GRU as in the generative model. And so we simply clamp the um, parameters. Um, the reason that we will reuse the transition model is um, intuitively, if you had the Oracle inference network that for each observation XT would tell you the true underlying ZT, then it would make sense that the ideal transition model to learn is the same transition model that was used in the generative model. And that's kind of the intuition of why we do this parameter tying. Um, second, um, in this sequential latent variable models, the posterior approximations, we compute them in a sequential manner. So at time t, we assume that we already have approximated the posterior at time point um, t minus one. And um, we want to propagate the more distributional information through the RNN. So previous methods, they propagate either the mean or just one sample from the previous approximate posterior. But our goal is to um, yeah, somehow exploit that we already approximated a whole distribution at ct minus one. Um, and the way we do this is by augmenting our variational model with another random variable, which is ST, which is the recurrent state of the RNN. So instead of propagating just one sample from the previous approximate posterior, if we take multiple samples and then propagate them through the RNN, then this is like an empirical version of this distribution of the recurrent state. Um, and finally, we have these um, samples that are propagated through the RNN, and we combine them with the new observations um, to give a, to parameterize a mixture density network. Um, and a mixture density network is um, just a great choice for um, modeling very multimodal distributions because they are uh, in, yeah, inherently multimodal. Um, and so this is the big picture idea. And now I will go into more details. Yeah. So when we choose a variational models, there are multiple choices that we make, right? Like first we decide on um, some factorization assumptions and then we parameterize the factors. And for a sequential um, latent variables like this, um, it's pretty standard to um, make this factorization in times where we, uh, and then we want to parameterize each of these uh, factors, Q of ZT, um, given the previous observations. Um, but actually we make another, um, we make more factorization assumptions. So instead of parameterizing these factors explicitly, um, we relate them to the posterior um, of the previous time step by writing them as a marginalization over the RNN step uh, state S T minus one. And so we make this um, marginal consistency assumption where we basically augment the factor by um, the recurrent state, st minus one, and integrate it out again. And 
instead we define the parameterization for these two factors. So we have a Q distribution for ST minus one given X less than or equal to T. And then we have an inference network that tells us how the recurrent state should be combined with the observation XT to give us the distribution um, over ZT. And so we just make distributional assumptions for those two factors. And then by performing this marginalization, um, this implicitly defines how, uh, how this factor is parameterized. Um, and since we will be approximating this marginalization with samples, actually also um, the choice of sampling method becomes part of our choice of variational family. Yeah. Um, and so to uh, define this variation of family, um, next we will look in more detail what choices we make for Q of ST minus one given X less than or equal to T. Um, actually, we only need to be able to sample from this distribution. And we further assume that it factorizes into a Q distribution. So here we use Qtilda just to um, highlight that it's different, that it's, a, that it's a different distribution than when we condition on X up to T. So, um, we say that it's a product of the of a distribution of st minus one up to x less than t multiplied by some kind of weighting factor um, and to approximate this marginalization um, we have to be able to sample from this and we define sampling from q tilde as sampling from the previous approximate posterior Q of ZT minus one given X less than T, and then propagating these samples through the GRU to give us samples from ST minus one I. Um, yeah, and then these weights, they will come back as important weights to account for that it's actually this uh, Q distribution that we need samples from for the marginalization. Exactly. And so um, the Q of ZT, given ST minus one and XT, we use an inference network. Um, and when we do that, then and plug in the samples, then we get that these factors Q of ZT uh, given X less than or equal to T. So each variational uh, posterior at each time point is a mixture density network. So it's this way that some, some of Gaussians um, whose means and variances come from a neural network that transforms the uh, samples from the previous posterior. Yeah, and so um, finally, um, we also make a choice as part of this uh, choice of how to parameterize the different factors. Um, we choose to set the weights as follows. Um, we the weighing function we use an indicator that somehow tells us um, under which of those Gaussian components the new observation has the highest likelihood in the genitive model. And um, by using an indicator function, we ensure that um, you know uh, that both this Q of st minus one given x less than or equal to t is a properly normalized distribution, and also our factor for Q of zt is a properly normalized distribution. Um, and so here is somehow the variational family um, summarized algorithmically. So um, assuming that we have already um, approximated the posterior at the previous time step, we sample uh, ZT minus one and propagate these samples to the GRU. And then they are combined with the evidence to create, so the new XT to create this mixture density network. And finally, we um, also take the weighted average of the um, states to give us an uh, average recurrent state, which we then can uh, feed into the GRU at the next time step. So we recursively get to this process. And so this is how we infer the um, 
the sequential latent variables. Okay, and so one important question with mixture distributions is always um, how do you select the number of components? Um, and it's true that this is something that should be, um, uh, you know, that has an effect on your results, um, but we didn't actually uh, play around with different values of K. Um, instead, for example, when Z is um, five dimensional, then we always used two uh, D plus one uh, samples. And the reason why we did this is because of the sampling method that we use to sample the ZIs. So um, to perform this marginalization, we developed a specific uh, sampling method. So what I showed so far also worked well when we just used MC sampling. Um, but it worked even better when we used this um, sampling method called the stochastic cubature approximation which we developed, um, which is based on cubature approximation. So the cubature approximation, given uh, d-dimensional Gaussians, it gives us a deterministic closed form uh, expression for how to optimally space 2d plus 1 points, such that the mean and the variance is the same as the underlying Gaussian. And because this is uh, deterministic, it somehow preserves the relative ordering of the um, of the samples. And um, also, when we all we want to take few samples, it somehow makes sure that they are optimally spread and they are not all, for example, close to the mode. Uh, yeah. And um, so we used a version of this called the stochastic cubature approximation, where we also use this um, deterministic. Uh, so given that our ZT is d-dimensional, um, we get 2d plus 1 optimally spaced centers um, around the empirical distribution of the Z. And then we add a little bit of noise to have stochasticity and sample um, each component uh, so each sample close to the um to the sigma points these points are called sigma points and yeah so this is just a little um, side note on the type of sampling method that we used um and but the whole method also worked well with mc sampling um and so um, we optimize the variational dynamic mixture using a loss that has multiple terms. So on the one hand, we have an elbow, um, but we also use two regularization terms, one that um, makes sure that the predictions um, are good, and another one, uh, an adversarial regularization term that somehow discourages the model to place uh, mass, to place predictions in areas where it's not supported by the data. Um, and the parameters of this loss are the, um, yeah, the neural networks that we used in the generative model and in the inference model. So this is, uh, they're shown here. Yeah, and so, um, I will not go into details of the elbow derivation, but um, here it definitely this working with S helped us. So introducing the recurrent state of the RNN made it easier to uh, yeah, take care of the integrals that would have otherwise been over all the past um, hidden states. Um, and second, our choice of the weighing function um, as an indicator function also made it um, made certain expressions tractable. Um, then one thing to note that in the elbow, the likelihood um, appears as xt given zt and um, st minus one. So this is um, yeah, a value plugged in for the recurrent state. Um, but um, we... In introduced another uh, regularization term where we directly optimize the likelihood of 
xt given zt, so not conditioning on a specific value for zt. And this makes sure that um, also the transition network um, focuses on making predictions that are accurate, that are, have high log, log likelihood. Um, and then, as I already alluded to, we also added an adversarial term. And so these two um, regularization term, the predictive and the adversarial term, these ideas, they come from um, computer vision, where also people have proposed to use this hybrid um, likelihood plus adversarial training methods um, to um, yeah, learn sharp generative models. Great. Um, and so with that, I come to our empirical study. So um, I already showed the taxi data, but we also analyzed other types of data. So for example, a stochastic Lawrence attractor, um, NBA players moving on a basketball court, and US pollution data. And all these um, data have slightly different um, properties. So, for example, the stochastic Lorentz attractor, um, it's chaotic. So and there's this split where it can go either right or left, and you, it's actually impossible or very hard to predict. Um, then the taxi data, we've already seen it. It is highly multimodal, but somehow this distribution is also very strongly uh, determined by the map. And in contrast, so NBA players moving on the basketball court, they can move anywhere on the court. So there's no really underlying map that um, tells you where it would be impossible to go. Um, but still, it's highly structured. And so here, too, it's um, useful to model this data with VDM. Um, and finally, we looked at US pollution data, which um, is um, the measurements of various pollutants in different um, areas in the US. And we don't have site information like season or location. We didn't use this information. And um, actually omitting this um, makes the data also um, multimodal. Yeah. And so um, we used uh, two obvious evaluation metrics. One is the um, multi head prediction accuracy in terms of log likelihood and then another one is one step ahead prediction um but somehow this is not all that matters for multimodal forecasts so when you have two routes that could be plausible continuations of your data and a model just predicts the average of both, then that's actually a quite reasonable thing to do. Um, but it's not multimodal. It's not capturing the multimodality. And so somehow we um, also proposed an evaluation metric that also takes the diversity of, foc of forecasts into account based on the empirical Wasserstein distance. Um, and we use this to complement the other evaluation metrics. Yeah. And so we compare to the methods that I already presented earlier in the talk. And with BDM, with k equals 13, we achieve um, the highest, uh, so the lowest negative log likelihood and also the best um, Wasserstein distance, so the lowest Wasserstein distance. Um, then on uh, like similar story on the taxi data and um, there actually for the multi-step uh, uh, prediction we can see that the CFVAE which is a global latent variable model and um, it achieves more accurate forecasts and so right it somehow gets right in which far end of the map a trajectory ends up and then it chooses a smooth average trajectory there. So this is something that we saw earlier in the um, pictures. And so we can see that this achieves very high um, uh, log likelihood results. Um, but then in terms of the Wasserstein distance, we can see that the forecasts are less diverse. And um, this is where um, 
the other um, methods, like for example, also the autoencoding sequential Monte Carlo, then does better and also VM does better. And another thing we visualized here is the um, an kernel density estimate of samples from ZT, uh, from a ZT um, at three different route points that are here marked on the left. And we can see that, um, okay, if we just use K equals one, so just one mixture component for VDM, then we get a unimodal approximation but with um, multiple mixture component, then the transition distributions of VDM are indeed multimodal. Yeah, and here are the generated um, trajectories for um, basketball trajectories, trajectories of basketball players. Um, so here two VDM, uh, generates plausible continuations. Um, actually, because there are not many um, nearest neighbors with similar um, starting behavior, we cannot evaluate the empirical Wasserstein distance, which is something that we need. Um, so here, the results are only in terms of flock likelihood. And similar on pollution data. Great, so um, that's it for my talk, and there's still time for questions. Uh, thanks, let's all thank Maya. We cannot hear the clap, so I'm sure everybody is clapping. Um, there are many people who asked interesting questions, so let me go through them. One of them is a composite question. Have you compared against MDN in the emission function P of X given Z as is used in the VRNN paper, for example? Um, what is MDN? Mixture density network, I assume. Ah, so um, yeah, we have not used, we have not tried using a mixture density network in the emission function of the RNN. Right. But um, we think that this would not be enough to really capture uh, multimodal dynamics mm -hmm. because, okay, we are not using the observation as autoregressive feedback. So only because you sample, uh, for example, that X, the next observation could be going right or left, that wouldn't mean, it wouldn't be enough to have this like break in the dynamics that the dynamics is now going right or left and then continuing straight in that direction. Mm -hmm. the, the second question is, in your paper, you report results for K equals one, which mm -hmm. you say is less powerful than the VRNN, but the results show that even K equals one work, works much better. Could you explain this difference even with a weaker? Um, yeah, so we have this two additional regularization terms, mm -hmm. which are the adversarial loss and the um, predictive loss. And so if the, the improved result in terms of log likelihood are probably from this predictive regularization term. Right. Okay. Um, but we also have an extensive ablation study in the appendix. So um, there we also have this comparison without the regularization terms. Um, what is the benefit of adding stochasticity to the quadrature rule? Uh, um, yeah, otherwise we wouldn't have samples. So mm -hmm. yeah, we need stochasticity um, to uh, like do the compute the expectations, right? So which each time we take samples, we get a different um, estimate of the expectation. So if we were getting the same estimate each time, that would be problematic. Yes. Another question in the Q&A is for the variational multimodal via elbow, what was the time complexity? Um, yeah, so we didn't um, work this out explicitly or write it down explicitly. Mm -hmm. 
but um, to, compared to the variational RNN, yeah. it's just a K times. So we have we take K times as many factors. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the additional factor, so to speak. Right. Uh, another question again from the Q and A is on slide sixteen. Could you please give a clarification of the equations on the top, top right, combining the weighted sums? Um, sure. Okay. So those two equations, they I had them on previous slides, right? They just tell, say how um, the different factors factorize, mm -hmm. and so um, we basically approximate this marginalization with samples from Q tilde. Um, and we use important sampling to reweight by uh, W, and such that it is as if we had sampled from this distribution, which appears here. Mm -hmm. right? So um, we take samples from Q tilde, um, multiply with the weights, and uh, use the inference network. Um, so those are the equations. And then here we just give the um, expression for the weights that we use in the end, which, um, yeah. Okay, great. Here is another question also from the audience regarding the factorization of the current latent variable with respect to ST minus one. Would you be able to achieve a similar multimodality if you used the same sampling method in a hierarchical latent variable model per time step? Do you want me to read again? Um, okay, so the question is whether we would use this, we would gain the same multimodality mm -hmm. if we sampled, um, if we had, for example, a hierarchical model, so there would be another layer of latent yeah. variables. I think that's what Yannick meant. Um, Use the yeah, same I don't know. procedure, but in a hierarchical latent variable model per time step. So per time step, you have say Z1, Z2, um, uh, Z3, however many layers of latency you wanna have. Would you achieve the same, the same multi um, Yeah. So. I think that's a great thing to explore. I don't know that you would be achieving the same multimodality. Uh, this is a question that I have myself. Um, these stochastic RNN type of work, they sometimes do inference by, you know, not only condition on, on conditioning on XT, but the current observation, but also the future observations. I think they have a name for that smoothing or filtering, There's, they, they call it uh, mm -hmm. one of those two terms. Have you explored that um, that uh, that idea of, I'm, I'm thinking that it would lead to an even better inference procedure because you have access to the feature, not only- Yeah, that, that would be really interesting. Yeah. So we haven't explored it, but, mm -hmm. Um, and it would be good for learning the generative model, right? We would get a somehow better posterior approximation and right. it would tell us how to, but on the other hand, it would be difficult to then use it in this um, forecasting scenario, right? So if we have observations until XT, yeah, um, you would probably be able to only infer up until ZT minus something. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, it's unclear. So yeah. I think it's an interesting setup that you mentioned, which we haven't explored. Um, so it's true that it would lead to stronger inference, maybe, but also then we could, wouldn't be able to use it in this forecasting. Right. So you're saying there's a trade off here to account for the type of tasks you want to do afterwards, like forecasting. Yeah. I think so, but if someone has other insights on this, I would be very curious also to hear them. Yeah. Maybe it would, it would be, this is just an idea that popped up. Maybe it would be interesting in a language setting where you wanna do imputation, mm -hmm. for example. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, just random idea. Um, I think those were the questions, both from the audience and from from us. If if there's anyone who has any other questions, feel free to ask it now. Otherwise, um, we can we can stop here and we see the contributed talks. All right, no questions. Thank you, Maya, so much for your amazing talk and uh, and answering all these questions. Interesting work. Yeah, thanks all of you so much for your attention and thanks for organizing. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Um, everyone, we will move to the contributed talks. These are pre-recorded talks, so you'll have. Um, there will be 10 minute 10 minute videos and then you can ask questions in the in the Q&A and I'll relay that to the speaker who will tune in once the talks are are, are done so let me share my youtube um, right now the first one is the gaussian neural process welcome my name is vessel and for the next 10 minutes I'll be presenting the Gaussian neural process to you, which is joint work with my collaborators, James Requina, Andrew Fong, Jonathan Gordon, and my supervisor, Richard Turner. Hey, short, I think you're not sharing your tab. Hmm? You're not sharing the, the tab for YouTube. You're still on the uh, speaker introduction slide. Oh, I was sharing, I was sharing my screen. Wait, let me do that now. Um, Screen. This one. Yes. Sorry for that. Start again. Here. Gaussian neural Welcome. process. My name is Vessel, and for the next 10 minutes, I'll be presenting the Gaussian neural process to you, which is joint work with my collaborators, James Requina, Andrew Fong, Jonathan Gordon, and my supervisor, Richard Turner. In short, the Gaussian neural process is a new member of the neural process family that models correlations in the predictive without sacrificing tractability. But before we get into all that, let's briefly review neural processes and introduce the concept of prediction maps. The setting of neural processes is meta learning, where there are many data sets, often small, and we wish to make a prediction for every one of them. We can view prediction as a mapping, where the input to the mapping is a data set, a collection of input output pairs. And the output is a probability distribution. For example, means and variances at test inputs. In this presentation, we call maps of this form prediction maps. We will denote a typical instance of a prediction map by pi. Neural processes are a powerful class of parametrizations of these prediction maps. To train a neural process, we consider many small data sets, split every one of them into a train and test set, called a context set and a target set and optimize the probability of the target sets under the predictions. Then, at test time, once a neural process is trained, to obtain a prediction for a test set that we haven't seen before, we can simply apply the mapping. The power of neural processes is that, at test time, they are able to produce fast probabilistic predictions for unseen data. Moreover, compared to, for example, Gaussian process regression, which requires an appropriately chosen kernel function, neural processes are fully data-driven. In this presentation, we will focus on a particular class of prediction maps, ones that are Gaussian and translation equivariant. We call a prediction map Gaussian if it maps to Gaussian processes, calligraphic P sub G, and we call a prediction map translation equivariant if prediction and translation commute. To build some intuition for this, consider a data set and the prediction for that data set. If we shift the data set by a certain amount, then translation equivariant states that the corresponding prediction should be equal to the original prediction shifted by the same amount. We've discussed neural processes and prediction maps. We now turn our attention to the Gaussian neural process. Consider a potentially non-Gaussian stationary stochastic process F, which represents some ground truth. For example, F could be assaulted. From this ground truth stochastic process, we can construct the posterior prediction map, which is the map that takes a data set to the corresponding posterior predicted. Stationarity of F implies that this map is translation equivariant. 
Today's goal is to best approximate the posterior prediction map with a tractable Gaussian prediction map that preserves the property of translation equivariance of pi f. This approximation is obtained by, for every data set D, finding the closest Gaussian process in terms of KL divergence. Note that the KL divergence is P to Q instead of Q to P and is between stochastic processes. In the paper, we provide a careful theoretical analysis of this objective, where, for example, we look at the existence and uniqueness of the minimizers, but we won't get into these details now. What the approximation of pi f is not doing is approximating the prior f with the Gaussian process and then performing Gaussian process inference. No, instead, the approximation directly approximates every posterior with the Gaussian process, which is much more flexible. The model that we present today, the Gaussian neural process, or GNP in short, is a general parameterization of the approximation pi tilde, which we'll use to find the desired approximation of the posterior prediction. That the GNP is a general parameterization follows from a universal representation theorem, which we prove in a paper. But again, we won't get into these details now. The GNP is a fully general parameterization of a translation equivariant map from datasets to Gaussian processes. Using the property the Gaussian processes are characterized by their mean function and kernel function, the GNP separately parameterizes the mean map and kernel map, where the mean map and kernel map take a dataset to respectively the mean function and kernel function of the prediction for that dataset. The mean map is translation equivariant, and we can use prior work to generally parameterize it. The kernel map, however, is more involved because it satisfies a particular kind of translation equivariance. It is equivariant only with respect to diagonal translations. We refer to the paper for details. In the paper, we demonstrate how such a map can be generally parameterized. This construction builds on the set convolution, where the key idea is to embed the data into a function space. The, par the parameterizations of the mean map and kernel map depends on some parameters theta, which will train using maximum likelihoods, where we maximize the probability of the target sets, the small test sets that we saw in the beginning, and then the predictions given the context sets. A major advantage of the GNP is that it models correlations in the predictive without sacrificing tractability. In contrast, to model these correlations, many neural process models introduce a latent variable, which sacrifices tractability consequently requires additional approximate inference. Let's see how the GNP works, but walking through a forward pass of the model. We first consider the mean map, which takes a data set to the mean function of the prediction for that data set. The graphs and images that you're about to see are from an actual model that we trained on samples from a GNP with a maternal 52 kernel. So you can really get a feel for what's going on inside. The first step of the architecture is rather abstract. Using a set convolution, we embed the data into a function space, which produces two embeddings, two functions. The function on the left is called the data channel and is given by a kernel regression estimate of the data. The function on the right is called the density channel and is given by a kernel density estimate of the data. The data channel communicates to the model the values of the observed data and the density channel communicates where data is observed. Without the density channel, the model would not be able to distinguish between observing zero or no data. In the next step, this functional representation of the data is transformed by a translation equivariant map, which in practice is implemented with a multi-layer convolutional neural network, or CNN in short, that uses 1D convolutions. The ellipses indicate that the CNN has multiple channels. This is the first channel and this is the last. Finally, the output of the CNN is combined to produce the model's estimate of the mean function. We can compare this estimate to the true mean function. Strikingly, there's almost no difference visually, which means that the GNP does a good job. The architecture for the kernel map, which is the novel part of the GNP, proceeds in an exactly analogous way. The first step is again an embedding into a function space. However, Whereas the mean function is a function of one variable, the kernel function is a function of two variables. Consequently, the embeddings for the kernel map are also functions of two variables, which are depicted as heat maps on the slide. Again, the data channel communicates the values of the observed data 
at the density channel where data is observed. But for the kernel map, there's an additional third channel, the source channel, which is simply equal um, to the density matrix. To build some intuition for this, note that the covariance matrix of white noise is exactly the density matrix. Therefore, the source channel kind of injects white noise to the architecture. Intuitively, the architecture uses this white noise to generate a stationary prior, which will then be modulated by introducing correlations inferred from the context set to produce the right predictive covariance. The necessity of the source channel is dictated by the universal representation theorem for kernel maps in the paper. In the next step, these heat maps, these images, which are the functional representation of the data for the kernel map, are exactly analogously also transformed by a translation equivariant map, which is again implemented by a CNN, now using 2D convolutions. Finally, the output of the CNN is combined to produce the model's estimate of the kernel function. Again, comparing this to the true kernel function, there's hardly any difference. The gene P really nails the term 5-2G. We now demonstrate that this architecture is translation equivariant. Let's apply a translation to the data. Because the prior is stationary, the true mean and true kernel shift accordingly. The embeddings are translation equivariant. So the translation of the data directly propagates to the functional representations. Using that the CNNs are also translation equivariant, the channels of the CNN also translate accordingly, which consequently means that the model's estimates again perfectly line up with the truth. Let's train the gene P on samples from a GP with a mature 5-2 kernel and compare samples of the trained gene P to samples of the convolutional neural process, called NP insured, which is among state of the art and also has translation equivariance built in. The models are trained in the gray regions and then evaluated outside of their training range. This ability to generalize is only possible because translation equivariance is built into the models. For example, the attentive neural process, which does not have translation equivariance built in, fails catastrophically in this task. The ground truth prediction is given by the purple dashed dotted lines. Note that both models nicely fill up the ground truth error bars. However, samples of the conf MP appear compressed into a smooth. In comparison, samples of the gene GNP look much better. They are nearly indistinguishable from samples of the ground truth. The gene P can also successfully be trained on non Gaussian processes, for example, on a sawtooth process with the random shift and random frequency. In this case, samples of the gene P, although they're not terrible and they do nicely interpolate the data, they look much worse than samples of the conf MP, especially far away from the observed data. This demonstrates that on certain non Gaussian tasks, non Gaussian neural process models like the conf MP can offer better performance. Let's wrap up. We have presented the Gaussian neural process, which is a parameterization of the translation equivariant map from datasets to Gaussian processes. An advantage of the GNP is that its parameterization is fully general, which follows from a universal representation theory. Another advantage is that the GNP models correlations in the predictive without sacrificing tractability. A disadvantage is that the kernel architecture is computationally expensive. The computational bottleneck is running that big 2D CNN of massive images. But we're working on this. We provide an implementation of the GNP within the neuroprocesses.gl, which is a Julia framework that offers composable building blocks, which can be mixed and matched in flexible ways to easily construct existing or new neural processes. We are in the process of also producing a Python version of the framework, but this is still in construction. That's all for the GNP, and thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in and for tuning in and um, presenting your work. Welcome back to 6S099 Artificial General Intelligence. Today we have Stephen Wolfram. You're gonna get right to the questions. Um, the first one is for the smoothing operation, what is the differential complexity? that you observed? 
Um, I'm not fully sure what you mean by differential complexity, but I'm going to interpret it as the computational complexity of the architecture. Mm -hmm. The to answer this question, um, it helps to uh, emphasize that these functional representations are internally represented by discretizing these functions. And the main computational expenses are dictated by how many points you use to discretize these functions. Mm -hmm. The smoothing operation is linear in the number of discretization points. Okay. I'll, you answer some questions here written, but I'll just ask them again for the audience so that you can reply live. Could you, Stefan asked, could you reiterate on how data are embedded into function spaces? Yes. The, so the, the data is embedded into a function space by mapping the data to a function. Mm -hmm. um, for the mean map, this happens by firstly producing a kernel density estimate where data is observed. The kernel density estimate can be evaluated anywhere and hence gives a function. Um, and the second functional embedding is a kernel regression estimate, which can also be evaluated everywhere and gives another function. For the kernel map, this is a little bit more complicated because now we have two dimensional functions, but essentially this kernel, this one dimensional kernel density estimate is placed on the diagonal of an image. And same for the kernel regression estimate. The second question from the audience was, uh, is there a bound on the stochastic noise injected on the stationary priors? Um, hopefully I understand the question correctly, um, which asks about the, the source channel and yeah. the diagonal. Now the source channel can simply be set to the identity matrix and the magnitude of the diagonal doesn't matter. Um, so for simplicity, it can just be fixed to one. Okay. I, think, I think these were the only questions. This one already, hope oh, there's another one. Is it correct that the computational bottleneck of the model like that of regular GPs is inverting the covariance matrix? Um, in practice for this model, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And that's because these, um, these big CNNs, these large architectures um, take up most of the time of the calculation. And that's due to the large discretizations that are required to represent the functional representations. Mm -hmm. So most of the time right now, goes to those CNN operations in terms of computational complexity. Yeah, the cubic scaling of the inversion is, is the bottleneck, but practically that's definitely not the bottleneck. Okay, these, are, these were all the questions. We are going to move to the next. Thank you. The next, yeah, thank you so much for tuning in and answering these questions. The next talk is titled Empirical Evaluation of Biased Methods for Alpha Divergence Minimization. It's work by Thomas Geffner and Justin Dumkey. Let me just share my screen so that you can all see it. Here. With Justin Dumkey. I'll be talking about the effectiveness of several existing alpha divergence minimization methods that use bias gradient estimators. Simply put, the goal of these methods is, given a target distribution P, to find the parameters of a distribution Q so that the alpha divergence between Q and P is minimized. Our main question is, how does the bias in these gradients affect the solutions these methods return? Do they return optimal solutions? Are they actually able to minimize the target alpha divergence or not? And to study this, we present a very simple empirical evaluation on two control scenarios. Our main conclusions are as follows. In low dimensions, these methods appear to work well and minimize the target alpha divergence. But as we increase the dimensionality of the problem, these, meso these methods often fail to minimize the target alpha divergence and just minimize the clear divergence from Q to P, which is the typical objective used for variational inference. Here we show some preliminary results. The exact setting and everything I'll describe later, but this is quite illustrative of this effect. The x-axis shows the dimensionality of the problem. The gray line shows the optimal parameters for Q that minimize the divergence KL from Q to P. 
and the black line shows the optimal parameters that minimize the target alpha divergence. We see that in low dimensions, the algorithm shown in red actually recovers near optimal parameters. But as we increase the dimensionality of the problem, the solutions returned by the algorithm are highly suboptimal and are actually very close to the minimizers of the clear divergence from 3 to 3. Here we give some background on the alpha divergence. We know that different values of alpha recover several well-known divergences. For instance, if you take alpha equals 2, you recover the chi-square. And it is also known that the value of alpha plays a strong effect on the properties of the approximating distribution Q. If you take alpha equals 0, Q will tend to model just one of the modes of Q. And as you increase alpha, Q will tend to be more spread out. For simplicity, in this presentation, I'll be focusing on two specific alpha divergences, alpha equals 1 and alpha equals 2. Here we show the corresponding gradient estimated. They are both quite similar. They are based on self-normalizing for sampling using k samples from the approximating distribution field. I won't describe the estimators in detail in the presentation, but what's important is that the, to see that the value of k imposes a trade-off. Increasing k reduces the values of the estimator, but increases their cost. And now we move on to our empirical evaluation. In the first setting, we set p to be a zero mean two-dimensional factorized Gaussian with variances that go linearly from 0 0.2 all the way up to 10. So some components of p have a low variance and some other components of p have a higher variance. In this case, we set q to be a zero mean isotropic Gaussian with covariance sigma q times the identity matrix. So q is very simple and has one single parameter, sigma q. The main benefit of this setting is that we can actually compute the optimal sigma q that minimizes the KL divergence from Q to P, the KL divergence from P to Q, and the chi-square divergence. So we can just run the algorithms and compare the results obtained against the theoretical optimal ones. Here are the results when we attempt to minimize the KL to Q divergence in a dimensionality DPM problem. The x-axis shows the optimization steps, and each of the color lines in blue, red, and green shows how the value of sigma q evolves as optimization proceeds for different values of k. Just for reference, the gray line shows the optimal sigma q that minimizes the KLQP divergence, and the black line here shows the optimal values for the optimal value for sigma q that minimizes the target alpha divergence. What we see is that using k equal 10, we get some optimal results, but as we increase k to 100 or 1,000, we get, we get parameters that are close to optimal. This is not really the case for dimension 1,000. In this case, we see that using k equals 10, 100, or 1,000 gives some optimal results. Increasing k still helps, but we don't recover the optimal parameters even using k equals 1,000. And this effect becomes even stronger when we consider a problem of dimensionality 1,000. In, what's interesting to notice is that the solutions returned by these methods are strongly biased towards minimizers of the KL divergence from Q to P, especially in high dimensions. And a second interesting thing is that the gradient estimators are asymptotically unbiased. This means that in theory, if you take K to be large enough, you should be able to recover near optimal parameters. What these results are showing is that in high dimensions, this K needs to be extremely large for these for this algorithms to actually be able to minimize the target alpha divergence. Here we show results for the chi-square divergence, and the analysis is pretty much the same. In low dimensions, things tend to work kind of okay, but as we increase the dimensionality of the problem, the solutions returned by these methods are strongly biased towards minimizers of KLPP, and an extremely large value of K would be needed to minimize the target alpha divergence. And now we move on to the second scenario we consider. We set P to be a logistic regression model, and we use two different data sets, one that has dimensionality 61, and the other one dimensionality 120. We set Q to be a mean free Gaussian, and in this case, we get a true mean and various parameters that minimize the target alpha divergence using MCMC. Here we show the results for the SONA data set, the one that has dimensionality 61. The first plot shows the results for the mean parameters and the second plot for the variance parameters. We'll focus on the variance parameters for now, and then we'll move on to the mean. The x-axis corresponds to the components of Q. Since the data set has dimension 61, we have 61 components. 
the y-axis corresponds to the variance of each component after training. The gray line shows the optimal parameters that minimize the field diverging from Q to P, and the black line shows the optimal parameters that minimize the target alpha divergence. The lines in blue, green, and red show the parameters recovered by the algorithm using different values of K. We see that increasing K gets us closer to the optimal parameters, but even using K equals 1,000 gives slightly suboptimal results. And for the mean parameters, we see that using any value of K recovers the optimal ones. And this is just because in this setting, the mean parameters that minimize the KLPQ, the KLQP divergence, sorry, and the target alpha divergence are exactly the same. The suboptimality effect for the variance parameters is actually much stronger for the higher dimension data set. In this case, what we observe is that using k equals 10, you basically recover the parameters that minimize the KL divergence from Q to P. And increasing k to 100 or even 1,000, we still get strongly suboptimal results that are very close to the minimizers of the KLPP divergence. Again, in this setting, we observe that if you want to recover the true optimal parameters that minimize the target alpha divergence, shown by the black line, you would need a value of k that's extremely, extremely large. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in these results, we recommend you have a look at the paper. We have results for other gradient estimators and other values of alpha for the alpha divergence. And we also present a simple connection between these failure in high dimensions and the way collapse effect observed in important sampling. And just to wrap it up, I'd like to emphasize our two main observations. First, these important sampling based brain estimators don't work well in high dimensions, at least in the settings where we try. This is not really surprising. It is known that important sampling doesn't work well in high dimensions unless a very good proposal is used or a number of samples that's exponential in the dimensionality of the problem is used. And the second observation, which is perhaps more surprising, is that the solutions returned by these methods are highly biased towards minimizers of the typical VI objective PDL from Q to P. So in high dimensions, we observe that these methods do not minimize the target alpha divergence, but just minimize the QLQP divergence. We are not exactly sure whether this is a general phenomenon or not, what we see this is a positive property of these methods. Even if they fail to minimize the target alpha divergence, they do a reasonable thing that's minimizing the TL divergence from Q to Q. So that's it. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll happily try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for tuning in. Um, I'll see if we have some questions from the audience. It looks like no. The, the only question I have is, um, yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> I think it's the same question as the one that Stefan just typed in, which is in some what are alpha divergence is useful for? Is it just an interesting theoretical concept? Which was what I was going to ask. Your 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 paper and talk seem to conclude that basically the best thing you have to do is just minimize KLTP. What are your thoughts on 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 that? Can you listen to me? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the results in this paper seem to suggest that if you're trying to minimize an alpha divergence in high dimensions, you'll have a hard time doing that. Yeah. But I mean, minimizing an alpha divergence has some benefits over other solutions, right? So if you have the distribution Q that minimizes the chi-square divergence, for instance, that's equivalent to finding the weights, the, sorry, to finding the distribution that minimizes the variance of the importance weights. So everybody, we know that, in, that a solution given by VI is biased, right? Mm -hmm. You usually don't model the exact posterior, you get an approximation. If you want to debias the results you get with it, you could, you could use, for instance, important sampling. And in that case, using the Q that minimizes the chi-square divergence would actually reduce the variance of the important sampling weights and accelerate convergence. Mm -hmm. So that's basically one of the reasons why I think that minimizing alpha divergence is like a good goal to have, but it's, a, it's difficult too. Mm 
there was one, this is just a commentary for me, there was, because I follow this line of work, there was one paper, one recent paper from Mike Jordan's team that said that alpha divergences are more useful for decision making. Uh, I, can, I can add that, send that paper, share it somewhere on our Twitter channel, for example, but maybe that's another useful case. Uh, there are many questions that popped up. Ying Zheng is asking, it is interesting that the solution is towards KLQP. I've seen work that tries to frame I-way, the importance weighted other encoder as minimizing KLQP in an augmented space. Do you think this could be potentially one of the reasons for that? Um, I, I ask, let me read the question again, I have access to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I, I'm familiar with that work that proposed like this, this way to interpret importance weighting that they are minimizing KLQP in an extended pace. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is the, I don't think that's the reason for this. I'm not sure though. I really, I'm really not sure, but my thoughts are more than that resampling in high dimensions, so doesn't work. So basically what I'm, if you have a samples from Q and you compute the importance weights and then you resample one of the samples according to the weights, right? Using a multinomial sampling process. In that case, one might expect that if you have many samples from Q, the sample that you actually end up resampling follows a distribution that's close to P. And we are looking into this, but that's not really the case in high dimensions. So the final distribution is very close to Q. So I think the reason for this result has to do with that. And, it, and as I said in the talk, it is well known that important sampling requires many, many samples in high dimensions, right? I think it's more along those lines, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's one question. Would any important sampling for any weights based estimator have issues, this issue of being heavily biased towards KLQP? I think it's the same types of question. Is important sampling basically to blame? Uh, I, I think so, yeah, kind of like, yeah, that's my guess that the yeah, important sampling this weights doesn't, they don't work, right? It is known that you need an exponential number of samples, an exponential number of samples that's exponential in dimensionality of the problem, right? Yeah. So it has to do with the resampling, they're all the same kind of thing in my, from my perspective, in my view, yeah. One last question from Mayank, other than Adam, have you considered other optimizations in alpha divergences? So maybe so, uh, he's trying to see if there's an interaction between the optimization procedure and the actual divergence. In this work, we only try the optimizer, Adam. Okay. But I'm pretty sure that if you try any other optimizer, you'll get similar results because the issue is the bias in the gradients, right? Mm -hmm. So if you get unbiased gradients, eventually you'll reach the solution with a small enough step size and so on. But if the gradients are biased, unless you debias them somehow, no optimizer will actually get you to the minimum. Yeah. Okay, okay great. I think we are now uh, done with today's session. Thank you so much, Thomas, for tuning in and for your Thank interesting you. work. Thanks everyone who attended the session today. Let me tease a little bit what we have coming for next week. Uh, the speaker is Justin Domke, who's from UMass, UMass, and his talk will be titled, titled Some Embarrassing Questions About Variational Inference. A very interesting talk, obviously. And we will also have two contributed talks, just like today. The first one is titled ArgMax Flows, Learning Categorical Distributions with Normalizing Flows from Max Welling's team. And the second talk is expressive yet tractable Bayesian deep learning with subnetwork inference coming from Cambridge, Jose Miguel Hernandez Lobato's team. So um, thank you for tuning in today and looking forward to seeing you all next time. Bye.